hopefully, uh, when you look at this, you can see that it fits the general form of an argument. It starts off with two premises and finishes with a conclusion. And what separates this from the propositional type that we've seen before is that the first statement is a quantified statement. Specifically, it's a universal statement. So what we're seeing here is an example of what's called the rule of universal instantiation. Right? The idea uh, is that if a statement is true for a group of objects, for example, even numbers, then it must also be true for every individual member of the group. For example, the specific number 42. Right, now, this idea, as we'll see later in the class, uh, is central to mathematical proofs. If I wanted to prove something about even numbers, for example, I might start by saying, let x be an even number. Then I can start making arguments about that individual, right, generic, but individual, uh, individual number, right? Confident that all the theorems, definitions, and properties that I know about the class of even numbers apply to my individual even number. So let's see uh, if, if we can take this argument and generalize it. Right. First, uh, notice that I rewrote the initial quantified statement in the universal conditional format. All right. Generalizing this, it becomes for all x if p of x, then q of x. Right. So referring back to our example, p of x would be x is even and q of x would be x is divisible by 2. Now in the second line, we need to reference a specific value. Right? So if we call that a, I can rewrite this as p of a for a particular a, or a makes p true. Right? Then our conclusion is just q of a. In other words, uh, a also makes Q true. So what we've ended up here, uh, what we've ended up with here is a formal version of that rule of universal instantiation. So I've got our new argument on the left and on the right, the form we've seen before of what's called modus ponens. And hopefully you see the connection between the two. They both talk about a conditional statement and its antecedent. And then they draw similar conclusions about the consequent. All right, this is why we call uh, our new form over here universal modus ponens. All right, now I've got an example here uh, that we you can use to illustrate this new method of argument. So take a look at the, at the two premises and, and think about what conclusion you can draw based on this new argument form that we've just been discussing. So the first premise gives us a general statement about squares and their areas, where the second premise identifies the figure to the right as being a square. That is, it's a specific instance of the category of shapes discussed in the antecedent of the first premise. Right, so from here, uh, our, new, our new tool, Universal uh, Modus Ponens, says that the conclusion, this piece here about the area of the square, must also be true for our specific square. So its area must be two squared or four. 
All right, so I'm sure that the last example was, was probably familiar to you. Applying theorems and, and formulas to specific diagrams uh, is something you do all the time in geometry classes, which is why I picked that out as our first example. So when we get further into the course and start looking at actual proofs, you'll see how multiple applications of this kind of argument can be strung together to, uh, to develop more complex arguments. So uh, in the next lecture, uh, we're, we're, we're going to really kind of do this process again. Right? Here we looked at uh, modus ponens, which is a, a very, very commonly used tool uh, in writing mathematical proofs. And in the next uh, lecture, we're, we're going to give this same kind of treatment, referring back to what we talked about earlier with propositional statements, we're going to give the same kind of treatment to the modus tollens argument.